So today I would like you to please brace yourself because uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you this morning, well, it's the kind that's hard to take. So um, remember, I didn't say this. This came from someone else, not me. You have to be careful with that, John. So you do that. But sometimes you have to take your medicine, isn't that right? Sometimes you have to take the medicine. Sometimes it doesn't feel so good. So would you open your Bibles with you to James chapter 4. James is the half-brother of Jesus. He became the leader of the apostles after Peter faltered in his denial of the Lord. And they chose James to lead and to be the head of the go. I don't know. If we'll see a little bit of his personality. Well, Thanksgiving, as I mentioned, is coming up. And... Lots of people are getting ready and so are getting prepared. Maybe you at your household have been had all kinds of things getting ready for Thanksgiving. I understand that it's the busiest travel time of the year. This is the one of the gates and getting in, getting your tickets at Minneapolis St. Paul, which I have been through many, many, many times, flying in and out of there, through there, living there. Um, it's a big airport and it gets super cold there. So it's the busiest time. Lots of people are moving and going around. I remember as a child growing up that fall meant we had to pick up leaves. And I don't know if this little guy's helping or hindering. I don't know. But he's having a good time doing that and making his fun there and having his playtime with that. I'm sure that these two uh, young boys are going to make their mother really happy when she comes out and sees what has happened in the bedroom. Uh, while they were not looking. I remember having pillow fights with my sisters um, and doing that, but I do not remember putting the, um, having the pillows break apart like that. Maybe it's selective memory, I'm not sure. But in fact, a lot of you are going, going to see family, friends, so forth coming around, and you have to be reminded you can't choose your relatives, you know. They're just, they're there. They're, it happens with you. And happens. So if you look with me in James chapter 4, we would like to look at the verse starting off the first. And it says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? That's a very good question. A very good question of what causes those fights and quarrels among you. Look at that happy face on that lady. Uh, go what causes the fights and quarrels? You may have wars, the word wars, but really the implication of the passage is fights. Those things that are fighting back and forth. When you're having just a disagreement with your brother or brother-in-law, depending on how you're doing it. And I like this picture of this young lady who wants to make sure you're so wrong in whatever you're saying. You are wrong and I am right. So James goes on and he makes this comment and he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? The, your desires that battle within you. And of course, the question I asked was, like what? Like what? What kind of desires? And those desires, verse 2, uh, those desires that came, uh, we desired but do not have, so you kill or you war against the person. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And which this brought me to a moment of reflection. <laughs> I remember growing up, I, I have four, uh, three sisters in my adoptive family. There's Candy, who was about 18 months older than I am. And then Becky, who is four and a half years younger. And Marianne, who is nine and a half years younger. Mm, almost ten. Um, I didn't fight so much with... Marianne, she was too small, uh, too young, 10 years behind, but that's okay. But the others, I had a grand time so much my mother would make us have silent times going. Well, one time, there was a time when I was just graduated from high school, my mom and dad said, let's get into the Pontiac, and we are going to take a trip across the country, all six of us in that four-door Pontiac. I will never forget that trip as long as I live uh, about getting, we were all jammed in there. My mother, we had two of us who could drive now since we had our driver's license. So 
she declared that uh, mother was the leader of the family on such matters. And she would say, well, what you're going to have to do is you're going to rotate every two hours. We'll stop, we'll change drivers. And we'll rotate every two hours. And so everybody be refreshed when they're driving. So that worked out. But sometimes I had to sit in the back seat and sometimes in the back seat in the middle. Uh, Mom, would you tell Bill to please move his, he's on my side of this, of the seat. What, I'm in the middle. Where am I supposed to put my feet? Back and forth, back and forth. He's leaning on me. She's leaning on me. Isn't it my turn to drive? <laughs> I don't know. As I, as I was thinking about this, it, it just... It just brought back a lot. Maybe you had, brothers and sisters, that you had some disagreements with. As I'm back and forth, you kind of, oh, everybody. I understand from psychology, educational psychology, that among children, sometimes adolescents as they go or as the children grow up, they need to have that kind of exchange to kind of identify themselves of who they are and what their rights are and so forth. I, I understand that that's what they, but my mother would never have agreed with that. He said, we've, got, we've had plenty of that in this house, plenty of that going back and forth about in that ride in that Pontiac, which meant five days over to Grandpa and Grandma's in Washington, D.C., and then five days back or longer with, with my lands. It's a matter that we spoke to each other when we got home, and I don't think we did. So do you do not have, you said you do not ask, you do not have because you do not ask God. He says, you do not ask God about it. So when you ask, he said, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says, without reason, that he jealously longs for the spirit that he's caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. He gives us so much more grace, as we talked about, as read to us. That is why the scriptures say, God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. God opposes the proud. Well, I don't know if it was a thing of pride. Maybe it was with my sisters in our arguments back and forth. It certainly was a declaration of space or who we are. I remember my sister who loved to tattle on me. And uh, so she would, you know, and Becky was the one who would always run my, you know what Bill is doing? Bill is doing, thank you very much. Um, so, we're going, you know, since we've grown up, no more bickering. Love my sisters. And as you know, I found my birth family, and now I have two birth sisters that I found. But they are a little bit older than I am, and they still call me their bratty little brother. I don't know why they do that, even at my age. I don't remember that, Donna? Yeah, you, you know Donna. Yeah, okay. So... The Bible says, submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, in other words, to get cleanse yourself from all this stuff. You, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Don't be double-minded. And then he goes on to say, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord. And, and, and be yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Well, that was pretty strong, wasn't it? Why would he tell us to be mournful? What he's really calling for us, and uh, James is saying, is to repent of trying to follow after the things and the pleasures of the world. That's really the, what he's talking about. So be mournful that you have been involved with that. Be mournful that you're happy that. I was just thinking of the song you see. A girl just wants to have fun. Isn't that right? She just wants to have fun. That's it. 
But the gospel, in the gospel, the final word is not condemnation, but an appeal for change of mind and heart. That's really what James is trying to get to. As he's saying those things to us, it's, it's really what he's trying to get across to us. Trying to say that. Really what it's calling for is a change of your mind and your heart. That God's grace will be sufficient. Put away those things that you're doing. Stop fighting with your sister. He says, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or a sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? And for that, I would say, ouch, ouch. You know, I, I really don't like reading that. You know, I really don't like reading that. <laughs> I think I'm going to take James off my Christmas card list for that. I, I don't know. I just kind of, as I was reading that, I, it kind of just, boy, tell us how you really feel, you know, just really laying it right out to you. And it kind of pinches and hurts. And you're like, well, that certainly wouldn't apply to me. Certainly wouldn't have. Well, you know, we have, if the shoe fits, you know, if the shoe fits. James can be tough to take. Did you know that? James can be tough. I wonder if that was why he was made leader is because he minced no words and went straight for it. What right? He didn't. He, his writing is different than John's, and we're going to look at John in a minute. But his way and his manner of doing things was different. And he was, he was very upfront and, all, and blunt, as it were. And sometimes as we've looked at James, we, where he says, you know, um, you are uh, saved by faith, but you, you have to have your works to go with it. He, to demonstrate that, he wants your life. Is, it's almost like it's a Methodist kind of feel to it as the Wesleyans picked up that concept and I think they may have got some of it out of that James where James was really direct in what he said but he also did tuck in their grace but we almost miss it because the rest of it is so strong and then I found this the genius of Christianity lies in the fact that it demonstrates renewal we have the capacity of being restored renewed there's no other teaching in the world that is so full of the concept of renewal there's no other religion in the world or the teach that brings you back to the concept of how you can be renewed and how you can have a change in your life and how you can set off in a different direction only coming through the power and the grace of god that's the point that James was trying to get to. He's trying to say that, trying to get that concept across to us, that only God can make those kind of changes. So perhaps I don't argue with my sister anymore, maybe because of maturity, but maybe because we renewed in Christ Jesus, that that's not how we treat one another, particularly those we love, care for. I don't care now if my sister leans on me. I don't care if, if that happens in, my, in the car. I'm happy to have them near me. And I miss them. The renewal. I, I found that in that fitting of James as he's trying to lay these things all out. And he's so, so up front, so harsh. So he kind of lays that out. That the complete restoring and renewing of your mind. Now would you turn to 1 John chapter 3. I like John. I'm going to keep him on my Christmas list. Because Christmas card list. Because I like him. And I can't wait to see him. Uh, in heaven. When we'll have a chance to be with him. 1 John 3. I'd like you to look at this, this. We're just going to take a little bit of it. The passage supports the concept. But I'm just going to take just a little bit of it. 
this morning. So in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, would you find verse 11 there? For this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Now drop to verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. That's a level of love that we don't often experience, do we? Years ago, I remember the story of a young boy who was, he and his brother were, his brother was very sick and needed a blood transfusion. And the match, the match that came for him happened to be from his brother. And so they said, would you give your blood to, to help your brother out? And after a little while, the little guy says, well, yes, he would do that. So he was laying down there, and they were getting ready to take some blood from him. And he thought he was giving all of his blood and that he would die. Not realizing they were just going to take a little to help his brother. They weren't going to kill him. But he gave it up for his brother. He gave up his life for his brother. And I was thinking of, my family was sometimes sometimes a, a relative needs an organ transplant. Would you give them one of your kidneys? I understand now they can do lung transplants. Would you give them what, what would you give? If you love enough, you would lay down your life for your brother and your sister. I believe that if we had a fire in this room, that I would do everything and possibly could to get you out, get all of you out, help you get out, push you towards the doors, get you out as best I could. I, would, I believe I would do that. But if my two sons were sitting here, or my three, four children, if they were sitting, but if my, they were there sitting right here in the front row, I'd make sure they got out first. Because I'm their dad. You know? Get them out, get them out. So John is saying we ought to have that, recognizing that our brothers and our sisters, our family, are each of us in Christ Jesus. Willing to lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. So many years ago, as you know the story, the pilgrims came escaping religious persecution. They came here, they came here to avoid the persecution that they were receiving from the church in England. They came to the new land seeking to have religious freedom. Tragically, they were not that religiously free in themselves for others, but but that was the purpose on which they came. And many of them lost their lives. And when they came here, many of them starved. And it was the Native Americans who rallied, who rallied around to save their lives and brought them food and kept them going. Can you imagine that? These are people that, that within just a few hours after they landed, they got in a fight with. So here the, the, the Native Americans are are taking care and supplying food to keep the pilgrims from starving. That's why, that's why we have Thanksgiving, you see. It's, it's not because of the football schedule. And, and, and it's not just because we want to get together and eat a lot. It has to do with Thanksgiving to God for what he did in providing us this country. And we gather in freedom, religious freedom here in this place, 
where no one was there to block you or keep you from coming this morning. You were free to come as you wished. And so we come just as the, the pilgrims do. We, we seek in this country religious freedom, which our freedoms are being challenged, as you may know. But John calls us back. We are to love one another. To love one another. As you gather for Thanksgiving around, I would ask you to remember on Thanksgiving Day, what to be thankful for. Years ago, I was watching the Cosby show, and Bill Cosby, they were ready for their Thanksgiving dinner, and, and uh, the father, Dr. Hux, Hux, Huxley, I didn't cry, anyway, is that right? He asked the family, he said, well, what are you thankful for? Well, I'm thankful for this, I'm thankful for that. So not one mention of thanksgiving to God. Not one. It's all about, well, love of the family, which is great. I'm thankful for that. But the love that comes to us, the love that's given to us, comes from God. That's how love really comes, because that's how willingness to do something for someone else. So love one another, Jesus said, as I have loved you. And he gave his life as a ransom for many, as I have loved you. So this morning, I would like to give you a thanksgiving blessing. So I ask the Lord to bless you, to be with you on this Thanksgiving day. May his grace be extended to you, and may you feel his arms around you, as you take this break, as you take on Thursday this break, to remember why we give thanks. That it is an important If you are the leader of the home, and in the home that you are in or place, would you lead your family in that particular prayer of thanksgiving to God for the freedom and the things that he has given to you, and remember what this day is truly about. That we may celebrate it as the pilgrims did, in celebration and thanksgiving to God. Unfortunately, thanksgiving has lost its spiritual thing because we say we can't bring that up in public anymore. Tragically. But we need to remember because we are God's children. So if you're the leader, if you're involved, would you please do that? So may God's grace be with you. May he fill you with his peace. May you really celebrate the great beauty of thanksgiving this coming Thursday. Dear Lord, I thank you for your grace towards us. I thank you for your giving to us. I thank you that we can call upon you, our Lord and Savior. But this week, we give special thanks to you for what you have done for us. We are grateful, Lord, and we praise your name. Amen.